The most important ingredient for state propaganda is historical ignorance. The observation typically attributed to the philosopher George Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, is based exactly in that recognition. The more history is forgotten, the easier it is to use the same exact methods of deception, falsehoods, and propaganda to manipulate the public. One of the realizations you have as you get older is that every year, the number of people who never lived through the events that you lived through and that you remember visit vividly increases. And even for those who did live through those events, the confluence of our rushed lives, our need to focus on our work and family, the deliberately the deliberate memory holding of those events and the memory erosion fostered by social media ensure that many simply have forgotten that which they learned and that which they lived through. And I can think of no major political event of the last 40 years for which this is more true than the anthrax attacks of 2001. There is no question that the so-called war on terror launched by the United States after 9-11 is, along with the 2008 financial collapse, the most consequential political event in our lifetime. It radically transformed how the U.S. government functions and its relationship to the U.S. citizenry, enabled it to seize previously unthinkable powers of detention and surveillance that endure to this very day. And it led to endless wars, occupations, bombing campaigns, drone warfare, a torture regime, mass dis domestic spying, due process free imprisonment, and all sorts of atrocities all around the globe. And few of any events fueled and enabled this multi-headed, quote, war on terror, like the September uh, 2001 anthrax attacks. And yet few people remember much about it at all. And that's because once it served its purposes, it was rarely discussed, including when, especially when, the FBI claimed it had solved the case by heaping blame for it on a dead man who would never have to stand trial and thus would ensure that the FBI's evidence never received real scrutiny. That's why we decided to devote a special episode tonight to reviewing this long forgotten yet indescribably important event. The facts of the anthrax attacks as they were presented to us at the time were quite simple. Starting on September 18th, just seven days after the 9-11 attack, when obviously Americans were in a, already in a state of fear and heightened concern when things seemed like they were unraveling in terms of our public security, a mass casualty attack by a foreign power on American soil that took down the World Trade Center crashed a plane into the Pentagon, killed 3,000 Americans just seven days after that, while we were all still re reeling from that. Media outlets began reporting that what they claimed was a highly sophisticated and extremely weaponized version of anthrax had been dropped in the mail and sent to numerous news outlets and American politicians. And over the next six weeks, Anthrax continued to appear, new letters continued to emerge, and they were accompanied by a very alarming statement that was clearly designed to link it to the 9-11 attack through which we had all just lived. And here you see on the screen one of the letters. This is the one that was sent to the NBC News anchor Tom Brokaw along with the anthrax that we were told was highly sophisticated, that only extremely advanced parties, very few on the planet, would be capable of producing. And there you see the letter. It says, this is next. Take penicillin now. Death to America. Death to Israel. Allah is great. So the letter was clearly intended to suggest that this was an extension of the 9-11 attack carried out by the same people and that it was going to be not just one one-day cataclysmic event, but a series of new events. This is next, it said, as though this was just the next terror in a long line of what was to come. Now, to remind you of how alarmist was the reporting around this anthrax attack, and justifiably so, it was supposedly this never-before-seen, in the wild, extremely sophisticated version that was highly fatal, and that could just be sent to you through your mailbox and all you had to do was open a letter and you would be killed when the spores dispersed. Let's show you just a few real-time network news reporting and cable news reporting about this event just to give you a sense for how this was talked about. 
Welcome back, everybody. It certainly has been a tough day and days for uh, all of us at NBC News because, of course, the press conference that announced yesterday that an NBC News staff member actually had been tested positive for anthrax. <laughs> A Florida man has contracted a very rare and potentially deadly form of anthrax. Rare inhaled form of anthrax. Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson calls it an isolated case and says there was no threat of terrorism. In Boca Raton, Florida today, a memorial service for Bob Stevens. He is almost certainly the first American to be killed in a deliberate anthrax attack. Now to the home front and those concerns over anthrax in Florida. After one man died from the illness and his co-worker was contaminated, the FBI has taken over the investigation. America strikes back. Anthrax, another infection. This time at NBC News and Rockefeller Plaza. Good evening. Tonight we find ourselves in the unusual and unhappy position of reporting on one of our beloved colleagues, a member of my personal staff who has contracted a cutaneous anthrax infection. That's an infection of the skin that is responding favorably to treatment and her full recovery is expected. There were two letters that were suspicious that both arrived on the same day. One contained a white talcum powdery like substance. The other contained a brownish, granular, almost sandy-like substance. In just a week's time, we have had four confirmed cases of anthrax, all with media connections and a number of anthrax scares as well. ABC News. In Nevada. The New Jersey tonight. The U.S. House of Representatives is closing offices today until Tuesday to allow a complete sweep for traces of anthrax. And 29 staffers for Senator Tom Daschle's office have tested positive for exposure to anthrax. The letters sent to NBC and the New York Post were the same. This is next. Take penicillin now. Death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great. The letter sent to Senator Tom Daschle had similar wording. You cannot stop us. We have this anthrax. You die now. Are you afraid? Death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great. All carried the date 9-11-01 at the top. All were sent from Trenton, New Jersey. I don't have anthrax. Good morning. President Bush tries reassuring the nation after anthrax is found at a facility that handles mail going to the White House. President Bush is calling those people who are mailing these anthrax letters evildoers, and he says any attempt to terrorize this nation is going to fail. Another day of germ warfare and still no sign the worst case of bioterrorism in this country is close to being solved. So you see how it unfolded over the course of six weeks. It began with one person, one case. And then over the course of six weeks, more and more letters appeared so that by the end, President Bush was announcing this was done by evildoers. It was called germ warfare. It was said to be the greatest, worst attack of bioweapons attacks ever carried out on American soil. So you can imagine how much of a role this played in escalating the fear that Americans already felt as a result of the 9-11 attack. By the end of October, when these multiple attacks had already manifested, there was almost literally nothing the government could demand that the American public didn't immediately acquiesce to as long as these new powers were described as being necessary to keep us all safe. That's how terrorized overnight the population had become, not only because of the 9-11 attack, but also because of these anthrax attacks. And they had no idea who perpetrated them, they said. But very quickly, the media started claiming, as a result of sources high up inside the government, that they began to learn who they thought the most likely suspect was at these attacks. It turned out, according to these media reports, that government tests had revealed the presence of something called bentonite in the anthrax. Through analysis of the anthrax strains, they discovered bentonite. Now, bentonite sounds like a very terrorizing and highly sophisticated substance. In reality, it's basically the clay that holds together kitty litter. Because the challenge with weaponizing anthrax is it's extremely light and is likely to disperse. And in order to weaponize it, you have to find a way to clump it together, to keep it together so that it only disperses when it's touched or moved, such as when opening an envelope. And according to these reports, the use of bentonite in weaponized anthrax was done only by one person on the entire planet. 
It just so happened to be the hallmark, they said, of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, who many of the same people claiming this had been wanting to go to war with and topple his government for years before 9-11. And the anthrax attack became the perfect attack to pin on him by laundering anonymous claims to the media that he was to blame. It's hard to overstate how frequently this was done and with how much certainty. So probably the worst offender at first was ABC News. Repeatedly, the investigative reporter Brian Ross went on the network news show of probably the most trusted television anchor of the time, Peter Jennings, and continuously pin the blame on Iraq. Let's look at one example. ABC's Brian Ross. Brian. Peter, from three well-placed but separate sources tonight, ABC News has been told that initial tests on the anthrax sent to Senator Dasho have found a telltale chemical additive whose name means a lot to weapons experts. It is called bentonite, a substance which helps keep the tiny anthrax particles floating in the air by preventing them from sticking together. It's possible other countries may be using it too, but it is a trademark of Saddam Hussein's biological weapons program. It does mean for me that Iraq becomes the prime suspect as the source for the anthrax used in these letters. So here you have a major television network, and at the time cable was nowhere near as influential as it, well, became. It's not very influential now, but it was nowhere near its peak. The network news was really the, where everything mattered, where everything happened. And arguably the most trusted show began laundering this claim over and over. Iraq was the most likely suspect. This was a hallmark and a telltale sign of the Iraqi weapons program. And the fact that this was done when Americans had very little defenses up when we were in a state of great fear, desperately wanting to find out who was attacking our country in these very dastardly ways, obviously meant that claims of this sort were instantly accepted. Now, after 9-11, David Letterman, who at the time was the highest rated late night comedy show, went on a hiatus because he thought it inappropriate to have a comedy show and be making jokes in the wake of the 9-11 attack and the anthrax attack. And when he came back, one of his very first guests was Senator John McCain of Arizona. And John McCain went on David Letterman's show. It had huge ratings because it was David Letterman coming back. It wasn't the very first show, but it was one of the first shows. And obviously, this is what Americans were interested in. And John McCain was heralded as one of the most knowledgeable and important foreign policy experts. And let's show you what he said to David Letterman about the anthrax attacks. I'm going to pull this video up for you in just a second. The second phase, if I could just make it very quickly, the second phase is Iraq. Uh, there is some indication, and I don't have the conclusions, but some of this anthrax may, my emphasis may have come from, come from Iraq. Was that right? If so there you see uh, John McCain. He's not being definitive about it, but he's... Uh, certainly saying that Iraq is uh, the most likely or one of the leading culprits just continuously putting into the ethos, into the ether, that when we think about the anthrax attacks, it's almost certainly Saddam Hussein who did it, and that's based on very technical, complex analysis conducted at the highest levels of the U.S. government that revealed the telltale sign of Iraqi bioweapons and the use of anthrax, which is bentonite. That was the claim made over and over. On, in October, John McCain appeared with his then sidekick, the Democratic uh, neocon senator from Connecticut, Joe Lieberman, who just nine months earlier had been the vice presidential candidate running with Al Gore on the ticket that lost to George Bush and Dick Cheney and that extremely closely contested race, and here you see Joe Lieberman right at John McCain's side, agreeing with everything John McCain had to say. Joe Lieberman, like John McCain, were two of the people, along with Joe Biden, who had long advocated overthrowing Saddam Hussein way before the 9-11 attack, and they went on Meet the Press. Obviously, lots of Americans were watching that program at the time. This is just six weeks or five weeks after the 9-11 attack. 
and listen to what they said. John McCain, quote, Recently in Rio, I believe an envelope was received which gives me the idea that perhaps this is an international organization and not one within the United States of America. Joe Lieberman, I've got mixed reports, but I'll tell you what I've concluded, and this is consistent with every report I've been given. The stuff that is being sent out, most of it, including the stuff that went to Tom Daschle's office, is significantly refined anthrax. In other words, when we hear the stories that there's anthrax in labs all over this country, that's basically bacteria in a lab tube. Dr. Fauci, Dr. Anthony Fauci, can tell you more detail on that. To take it from that, to make it into the stuff that's being sent in envelopes and that requires a real effort and frankly more than a couple of guys in somebody's kitchen stirring things up. So it says to me that there's either a significant amount of money behind this or this is state sponsored or this is stuff that was stolen from the former Soviet program. Here on September, uh, in September, I believe it's October 14th actually, 2021, is a headline in The Guardian. There you see it, Iraq, quote, behind U.S. anthrax outbreaks. No caveating, no uncertainty, a bold statement quoting some unknown person that we should just blame Iraq. We should assume this is Saddam Hussein attacking the United States in the most dastardly and ethically limitless ways. Quote, American investigators probing anthrax outbreaks in Florida and New York believe they have all the hallmarks of a terrorist attack and have named Iraq as prime suspect as the source of the deadly spores. Their inquiries are adding to what U.S. hawks say is a growing mass of evidence that Saddam Hussein was involved, possibly indirectly, with the September 11th hijackers. So you see here, they weren't using the anthrax attacks only to claim Saddam did it. They were using it to claim Saddam was in an alliance with Al-Qaeda, which of course was necessary to convince Americans to go and invade Iraq. And a poll at the time, six months after the invasion, in fact, showed that 70% of Americans, 70% believed that Saddam Hussein had personally participated in the planning of the 9-11 attacks. You had Jeffrey Goldberg, who has since been promoted to one of the most important and prestigious positions in journalism. At the time, he was a New Yorker correspondent writing articles claiming Saddam Hussein was in an alliance with Al-Qaeda. Jeffrey Goldberg, of course, was part of the neocon camp that long wanted to overthrow Iraq. Do you see how they were using, exploiting these events to advance an agenda they had long craved to execute? Quote, U.S. intelligence believes Iraq has the technology and supplies of anthrax suitable for terrorist use. Quote, they aren't making this stuff in caves in Afghanistan, the CIA source said. This is prima facie evidence of the involvement of a state intelligence agency. Maybe Iran has the capability, but it doesn't look like politically. That leaves Iraq. That's as definitive as it gets. Now, as it turns out, the CIA source and all these sources laundered through The Guardian and other sources turned out to be right. There was a government involved, a very sophisticated government involved in manufacturing this weaponized anthrax. Just turns out it wasn't the United States, or it wasn't Iraq or Iran, but the United States. Here in, on June 1st, 2002, so as we're building up to the question of whether we need to go and invade Iraq, there's an article in The Atlantic by Jonathan Rausch entitled, Does Al-Qaeda Have Anthrax? Better assume so. Quote, the operatives and allies of Al-Qaeda have something in mind for the United States, of which there can be little doubt, something nasty. Vice President Dick Cheney said in May, it is, quote, almost certain the terrorists will strike again. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld warned that terrorists inevitably will get their hands on weapons of mass destruction and, quote, they would not hesitate one minute to use them. Question, what if they already did use them? and are preparing to do so again. Were last year's anthrax attacks, which caused five fatalities, a preview? In November, the FBI issued a sub-suspect profile identifying the likely anthrax attacker as a single adult male, probably an American with a scientific background, lab experience, poor social skills, and a grudge. Some people, I was one of them, viewed this interpretation with skepticism. What would be the motive? Why the timing so close to September 11th? A number of analysts, including David Tell in a useful article in the Weekly Standard on April 29th, that was the Neocon Journal, founded and edited by Bill Crystal, have subsequently cast doubt 
on the disgruntled scientist hypothesis. And an FBI spokesman said in May that the Bureau, far from being convinced that the attacks were carried out by an American loner, has, quote, not precluded any category of suspect motive or theory. If anything, hints that anthrax and al-Qaeda may be linked have grown harder to dismiss. Now, all of this was significantly elevated from very influential media outlets like ABC News, Meet the Press, The Guardian, John McCain, Joe Lieberman, into the, a presidential pronouncement. When at the start of 2002, George Bush in January of that, of that year gave his State of the Union address that was notoriously written by the neocon David Frum. That was the speech that notoriously proclaimed that we were fighting an axis of evil that was composed of Iraq, Iran, and North Korea because these neocons were not content with only getting to Iraq and overthrowing Iraq. They also wanted to overthrow the government of Iran in the name of 9-11 and anthrax. And here you see George Bush take this same claim and elevate it to a State of the Union address. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. The Iraqi regime has plotted to develop anthrax and nerve gas and nuclear weapons for over a decade. This is a regime that has already used poison gas to murder thousands of its own citizens, leaving the bodies of mothers huddled over their dead children. So that was David Frum's work, circulating absolute lies designed to put into Americans' mind that the state responsible for these anthrax attacks was Iraq and Saddam Hussein as part of the already well underway effort just weeks after September 11th. This was barely three months after September 11th to prime Americans to blame September 11th on a state that had no involvement of any kind, either in the 9-11 uh, attacks or in the anthrax attacks, which was Iraq. Do you see this barrage of lies how it was laundered by the very media outlets that still claim that they're the only ones who can be trusted, manufactured by the very people who ended up constantly being promoted and elevated. David Frum is also at The Atlantic with Jeffrey Goldberg. Bill Kristol is one of the favorite guests of CNN and MSNBC, a hero of American liberalism. George Bush has been completely rehabilitated, as is Dick Cheney, thanks to the liberal worship of his daughter, Liz Cheney. And the CIA continues to be a highly trusted source for American media outlets who just leak to them anonymously, as they did over and over here, and are just constantly believed. Now, at the time, there was all kinds of reasons to believe that this was a lie. To begin with, it isn't just that bentonite is an extremely common substance. Like I said, it's the thing that is used to produce cat litter. The idea that it's some specialized ingredient that only the sophisticated Iraqi scientists could possibly use to weaponize anthrax was a joke from the start. But the much more important point is that there was never any government analysis as ABC News ended up admitting that detected the presence of bentonite. It was a totally false story from the start. The sources who went to ABC News and told ABC News that bentonite was detected in government uh, analysis completely lied. If you go to journalism school or read journalistic ethics books, one of the things you will read is that the only taboo in journalism is revealing who your sources are if you promise them anonymity. Now, you may remember during Russiagate, that was a, supposed to be a, 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 a sacred principle. So sacred, in fact, that Americans are supposed to go to jail, American journalists are supposed to go to jail in order to not reveal their sources, even if you're ordered by a court to reveal it. And American journalists have gone to prison before by defying court orders. That's how sacred this principle is. During Russiagate, a obviously unwell blogger named Marcy Wheeler had promised anonymity to a source of hers, but she became convinced, because she's unwell, that this source was some sort of smoking gun, some critical part 
proving collusion between Trump and Russia in 2016, and without even being asked to do so, let alone subpoenaed or ordered to turn over the identity of her secret source, she begged the Mueller team and the FBI to give her a few minutes. She fantasized that she was part of the Mueller team, that she had in her hands the smoking gun proof of collusion. And she, on her own, voluntarily went to snitch on her own source to whom she had promised anonymity. The greatest taboo in all of journalism, and American journalists applauded her. People like Margaret Sullivan, the then media reporter for the Washington Post, CNN, wrote articles glorifying what this woman had done, this obviously unhinged woman. Now, it turns out she snitched on her source. He wasn't even mentioned by the Mueller report. He had no involvement in any of this. It was all a sick fantasy that she had concocted in her head. She wanted to be part of the Mueller team. And so they applauded her. They, 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 the American media applauded somebody who voluntarily, without being asked, let alone subpoenaed, turned over her own source. And to this day, she's like a favorite of the dead end or Russia gators. But usually that had always been a very sacred ethical precept is you don't ever reveal the identity of your sources to whom you prove anonymity, except in one case, when it not only becomes permissible, but required, ethically obligatory, to reveal the identity of your anonymous sources. And that's when they deliberately lie to you. When they use you to disseminate to the public lies that they know are lies at the time. And there is no question that the three or four high-level sources that Brian Ross claimed went to him to tell him that government tests had detected bentonite deliberately lied to him as a way of trying to get the American public to blame Saddam Hussein in Iraq for the anthrax attacks because those are the very people in the government who were so eager long before 9-11 to invade Iraq. And I spent two years badgering ABC and Brian Ross about this. How is it that you can continue to protect the identity of these high-level government officials who on one of the most crucial issues of our time lied to ABC News and all these other sources you had Joe Lieberman and, 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 and John McCain and The Guardian and then finally George Bush through David Frum's speech writing disseminating the same lie that led to the Iraq war. How can you possibly protect the identity of these people? ABC finally as a result of that badgering admitted the stories were false, admitted there was never any government test that revealed the presence of bentonite and they finally retracted them but to this day they refuse to reveal their own sources who lied to them. High-level government sources. That's the reason people in the CIA and the FBI and Homeland Security and the FBI know that they can lie to the media on purpose without any accountability because they do so while hiding behind a shield of anonymity. So even if you know they lied, the media will protect these liars, people who are deceiving the public on purpose through the use of their media platforms. Even though it is journalistic ethics 101 that you not only have the right but the duty to expose sources who do that, they never do because they don't want to lose their sources. Even if they know that those sources are feeding them false information, it's still at least somebody giving them stories. But beyond the fact that this whole thing was a lie from the start, the whole basis of blaming Iraq that I, all these people just did, the reality is everything we knew about the, am the, the anthrax strain would have led us to believe that it was a government involved, but not Iraq or Iran or Al-Qaeda, but the United States government, because the report suggested that the strain that was sent was the Ames strain. And the reality was that was a telltale sign of a government weaponizing anthrax. It was a telltale sign of the United States. The AIM strain was a strain the United States government at Army Labs had developed. And in 2011, front... Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free, live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble, and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.